spare, Afghanistan. Before Harry sets off to Afghanistan, we get the recollection about his driving through the tunnel in Paris. He explains that it's now 2007 and England was in the semi-final of the 2007 Rugby Cup. He was invited to the semi-final in October and he went. And he asked the driver if he knew the tunnel where his mother had... Well, he doesn't finish the sentence. And he explained to the driver that the tunnel's called Pont de Lama and he knew of it and that Harry wanted to go through it at 65 miles per hour, which, of course, as you know from parts passing, was the exact speed that his mother's car had supposedly been driving, according to police, at the time of the crash, not 120 miles per hour, as the press originally reported. And therefore, he explained that he went through it, he counted his heartbeats, and then emerged from the other side and thought, blimey, well, it's nothing, it's just a straight tunnel that he went through. And... Then he wanted him to go through it again, so he did, and then thought, right, that's enough. And he thought, actually, that this was a bad idea. He told himself that he wanted closure, but actually he didn't really. He wanted to feel in that tunnel what he felt when JLP gave him the police files, disbelief. And at this point... It was the night that the doubt fell away, and then he realised that she was actually gone for good. So this is some ten years after that his mother had died that he got the closure that he finally sought. And he said that he was close to one o'clock in the morning, and he was dropped by his driver at a bar where he drank and drank, and he tried to pick some fights, and then... Uh, he was thrown out. Of, they were thrown out of the pub, and then he tried to pick a fight with Billy, who just didn't react to him. And they basically carried him up, put him in his room, and then the sun was just coming up, and there was a bodyguard outside the chair on the door, but he was asleep, and he decided that he was going to wander off away from his bodyguard, which was the golden rule that he ought not to do. So he then wandered off in Paris and then had a look around. He drank, he was looking at people early in the morning and he thinks that some people recognised him, but nobody stopped to take a photo and it was in the age prior to smartphones. And then he went back and fell asleep. And then William was coming out and afterwards, they talked about the crash for the first time. They talked about the inquest, which they said was a joke and riddled with errors, etc. And they thought that the conclusion that Mummy's driver was drunk and thereby the sole cause of the crash was convenient and observed. And they felt ultimately, they felt that the driver shouldn't have been able to have any difficulties navigating the tunnel unless he'd been blinded by the PAPs. And then they were querying, why hadn't they perhaps been thrown in jail? And they wondered why that wasn't the case. So it appears that ultimately that trip to Paris was some degree of catharsis for Prince Harry. Although, as now we know, not really, because although he seemed to accept that his mother was dead, and then he went off on one in terms of getting pissed up and trying to pick fights, he hasn't laid her to rest because he repeatedly mentions her and the circumstances of her death again and again and again. He then moves on to explaining that he's at RF Bryce and Orton and was boarding the relevant plane. He apparently had boarded in secret and he lay down on the bottom bunk as he headed off to Afghanistan. And he explained that most of the things that he needed or wanted had been left behind other than a few pieces of mummy's jewellery and a lock of her hair in a little blue box and the silver frame photo of her that used to sit on my desk at Eton, all of which he'd stashed in a safe place. So he'd left those things behind and stashed them, which shows the mementos that he still keeps. He talks about the weapons that he has and then it seems like the flight took a very long time to go to get to its destination. 
He was thinking about his dad, his brother and Chelsea. And apparently the Poipers had reported that he'd broken up with her and that it was too difficult for them to maintain a relationship. And apparently it was reported that he'd gone on a pub crawl and got uh, pissed up. He then said, well, he thought to himself, if he dies in Afghanistan, he'll never have to see another fake headline. And then he wondered, how would I be remembered? By history, by the headlines? Would William walk behind his coffin? Would his grandfather? Would his father? And he was told before he went out that he should update his will. He eventually dozed off, and then he was arriving at Kandahar Airfield, put on his body armour, and then he had to wait while everybody else disembarked. Special forces turned up. They gave him his weapons and handed him a vial of morphine to keep on his person. Then they drove to a different part of the base and there was nobody around. And that it would appear that they left in the middle of a meal and they'd left uh, half-empty pizza boxes and Harry recalls that he hadn't had anything to eat so he started shoving cold pizza into his mouth. He then took his in-theatre test to show that he knew how to do the job and then climbed into a Chinook and flew 50 miles to a much smaller outpost, which was Forward Operating Base Dwyer. And he said it was a rather long name for something that was more than a sandcastle made out of sandbags. And then he looked around the place, was somewhat startled at its Spartan nature, that there was only cold water in the showers that all the men were covered in sand and within an hour he was as well and he said that eventually he fell asleep and woke up with sand in his mouth and then he tells us about the fact that in the middle of Dwyer there was a sort of monument which had all the various places of somewhere that a particular soldier at Dwyer called home so there was Sydney, Australia, 7,223 miles. Glasgow, 3,654 miles. Bridgewater, Somerset, 3,610 miles. And he thought about putting up his own. Clarence House, 3,456 miles, but then decided against it because it would attract the attention of the Taliban. He talks about the cannons that fired at the Taliban, and then he goes on to telling us about the ops room and what was in there. He met a corporal in there and learned more about what was going on and where the corporal was from and then he got down to work and he was shown the various radios and what he should be doing with them and that he would be dealing with basically being a security guard monitoring feeds from dozens of cameras etc and then he got ready to work and he was uh, talks about watching the rover terminal and he said that its alternative name was kill tv because uh, the only thing that actually was getting killed was time because it was absolutely boring watching this and he explained that nothing would happen he was watching a sand dune and then he said if there's anything duller than watching paint dry it was watching the desert he explained that he tried to work out what the uh, accents of the various pilots were. So, for instance, he explains that American pilots were dude, Dutch pilots were ramit, French were mirage or rage, Brits were vapour. Apache helicopters were called ugly. He then explains that he was given a handset to introduce himself and... He explained that the one thing that was required besides information was permission to do certain things. So he liked the idea that he was the keeper of all of this and that he was working, being the eyes and ears for these highly skilled individuals. He then explains how it would work in terms of what the pilot might do if he was received permission to go into Harry's airspace and... He talks about that he sat at the desk with a fizzy drink and a biro, and I think it's a reference to the gift from Princess Margaret, where he goes, oh, a biro, wow. But he said it was exhilarating. It was the thing that he was trained for. And he explained, for instance, 
that um, in one instance, before he'd arrived, an FAC had got a number wrong, so a bomb landed on British forces rather than the enemy, which killed three soldiers and maimed two horribly. So he recognised the importance of what he was doing. And he said he was happy. He said he was using the skills that he'd obtained and that he enjoyed what he was doing. His call sign was Widow67, and he explained he had plenty of nicknames, but this was the first nickname that felt like an alias that would enable him to hide. No title, no bodyguard. And he said that he savoured the normality of this. He explained that after every action there was a lull, and it was quite difficult to deal with that. Boredom was the enemy, and it needed to be fought off. And he talks about all the various things that they did to try and dispense with that enemy. And he talks about the kitchen and then the uh, phone system that could be used and he would call Chelsea so it appeared that their relationship wasn't over and sometimes he would uh, speak to his father but his father encouraged him to write to him because his father always received always preferred and loved receiving letters so once again quite a lot of insight that's provided uh, with regard to the environment that he was in and how he in effect took to it like a duck to water no mention of course of being at the front line but dispensing his duties which on the face of it looks to be accurate and once again getting involved in some honest work not the academic side of things very much seems to suit him and creates an air of contentment for him which is interesting to contrast with the life that he now has coming up next there's more in relation to Afghanistan, but specifically about fighting the Taliban. Join me there. <laughs>